Uh, so hello everyone, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so my name is Raphael Bido Waddington, I'm the, the founder of Lead Future Lab. Uh, I will tell you more about it a bit later. Uh, as a start, I'm going to maybe tell you a little bit more about the uh, Future Literacy Summit that is the UNESCO is organizing this it started two days ago and it will continue until Saturday evening um, and uh, uh, envisioning a future spaces and lead are part of the exhibitors of that summit. Um, the UNESCO has developed this new approach of foresight, which is called futures literacy. It's a statement of the UNESCO to say that foresight should not be like an expertise and a, and a narrow community, but it should be more a competency, a skill that everyone should be entitled to develop. And so that's that new approach of, uh, I would say, anticipation and uh, future future exploration uh, is in fact questioning the fundamentals of the foresight community. So also the, the, the UNESCO is interested in engaging uh, um, federating the international foresight community to engage in this collective discussion about what are future literacies and how they can be uh, uh, spread in the society as a as a development uh, uh, skill uh, also and uh, as part of that summit uh, so envisioning uh, future space and lead we are part of like the the more uh, experimental and disruptive uh, uh, structures. The UNESCO was also encouraging uh, exhibitors to share their expertise together. And so the th the, uh, our three structure decided to organize this masterclass uh, as an occasion to share our experiments, our methods, our innovation, our also our exploration and to be a little bit in a research mode and also engage in a conversation with the audience to explore what could be those future literacies uh, um, uh, and how to use them. Uh, so this is to give a little bit of, of the context. So please go and visit the booth of the UNESCO. It's about 100 uh, platforms. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's also an interesting uh, uh, virtual experience with those booths that are, you know, very, like it's tiny booths, but it's still uh, an experience, uh, a live experience. Um, so this is to give a little bit of context, but let me now introduce my peers, my co-host uh, for um, Future Space. We have uh, Tanya Schindler and uh, Graciela Gadara, Gadarama. Sorry, uh, we are from Berlin. Uh, you will be the first to speak, but before that, let me present also our team from Envisioning. We have uh, Tiara Cavadas, who is the head of research at Envisioning, Michel Zappa, the founder of Envisioning, and Galdin, uh, Galdino Pedron, who is like a, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the corridors, I would say. And uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, so the session, it will be two, uh, an hour and a half. We are going to have like a short presentation of each of our structures, share our method, best practices, and you know how we work. Uh, and then we'll engage in a collective discussion among us and also with the audience. So please uh, uh, feel free to already put in the Q&A your questions. We'll keep an eye on them. And in between each presentation, we're going to make a, a brief a moment uh, to already address your question. So we really want to be in an interactive mode, uh, sharing experience, sharing expertise, but also you know engaging in a in a research, in a, in a lab with, uh, with the audience. And as a starting point, I'm going to already give the microphone to Tiara, uh, who even before uh, Future Space start the presentation is going to uh, uh, send to the audience uh, a first question. Uh, Tiara, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Rafael. Uh, thank you everybody who is here today. Good morning from Sao Paulo. Now it's 7 a.m., so excuse me my morning face. I'm really happy to be with you guys today. Uh, well, first to start, I would love to ask you a few questions. So just let me share my screen with you really, 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 really quickly. For our experience today, we will be using two screens. So you are probably now watching us on your web browser and your desktop. But I would love for you to pick up your phones now and scan this code so you can be part of this presentation. We'll be asking a few questions and you'll be able to also interact with us while we are presenting this session. So it would be lovely if you join us. I see there's already 
25 people who is joining the QR code via their uh, phone. So thank you very much. I'll just wait for everybody to, to join us as well. Yeah, it's working. Awesome. Let us know if there's any issues with that too, because it's the first time we will be using it. Uh, so you're on the prototype mode here with us today. Cool, we have a lot of people. If uh, you can't get uh, the care code working, you can also go to ahaslights.com slash go beyond, which is the name of our session in our second screen, in our phones. So I guess we have everybody who is with us already on the care code. So ask our first question to the audience, which is, where are you based? So just so I let you know, uh, as I said earlier, I'm in Sao Paulo. Also, there's Michelle, uh, Tanya and Garcia are in Berlin, and Rafael is in Paris, aren't you, Rafael? <laughs> Whoa, Denmark. Jakarta, London, Cape Town, that's amazing. Budapest, Melbourne, Copenhagen, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm glad we made this question, amazing. The world is appearing under our eyes. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> Helsinki, Melbourne, Sao Paulo as well, amazing. Nice, thanks guys for this first interaction. This was just a head start. And I would also like to ask you now for a next question is how experienced are you with foresight in future literacy? Are you an expert? Are you still working a bit on it or uh, you're a newbie? We want to know that so we can calibrate a little bit our presentations and see how much deeper we can get into our methodologies. Amazing. So mainly intermediaries and newbies here today. Thanks very much. So I will pass on to uh, Future Space now uh, so they can make their presentation based on that. I would like you to please hang on with your cell phones because during Vision's presentation, we'll be also using it. Uh, so please don't log out from your phones and see you soon. Thanks, Tania Graciela, the microphone is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Tiara. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, uh, well, uh, here uh, we are. This is uh, Graciela um, and we have Tania as well. We are both the founders of Future Space, the uh, digital home for futurists and futurist activists. And we'd like to start with uh, this quote because um, as futurists, I see that uh, based on our question before, we have a lot of newbies and, and, and intermediate people and throughout our conversation, our presentation, Tanya and I are gonna talk a little bit more about what is this, this predict versus create the future. Um, but yeah, as Abraham Lincoln and Peter Drucker say, the best way to predict the future is actually to create it. Um, all right, so uh, we're gonna talk about futures beyond scenarios because most of you probably, if you've heard about futures and foresight, have heard what scenarios are about because that's one of kind of the most popular ones but we're gonna go through our more um, uh, favorite ones. All right, but first of all, we would like to uh, show you a video of why we should actually care and think about the future. Uh, and this is, this is a video that starts in the 80s with um, like a desk, a desk where you can see like you have a printer, you have a computer where you have a bunch of books, you have a telephone uh, and another uh, bunch of devices, your calendar and all that. Um, and and what, why it's important to think about the future is because of the rapid change. We can see that in, in a decade or two, all these different products uh, have uh, completely disappeared or have transformed into a computer, into another place. And if you are part of one of these organizations, you really need to, to understand the future to, to stay relevant. Um, we know many of these organizations, products, uh, companies don't exist today anymore. And this is 2014. So... Uh, think about what is what is it right now at 2020. We have just like a computer and a cell phone. All uh, right, so because we're here at the UNESCO Futures Literacy Summit, uh, we'd like to share with you what uh, our our take on futures literacy. 
If you are new to the summit, um, this is maybe the first approach uh, to to um, to this word, to this concept. But if you've also been here and for other talks or other conversations, you're going to see how this really big concept um, it can be taken um, differently by different organizations, companies, or people. And so our take on futures literacy is actually this sweet spot between the cognitive futures thinking and the practical, which is the futures and methods and the tools. In this sweet spot, we call it like an, kind of the futures mindset. Um, so in the, in the futures methods and tools, we have, um, as I said before, probably these things that, um, um, these concepts or words you all know much more, which is probably trends and scenarios, but there's so much more around that there are like different tools and methods for different purposes. Uh, and around the thinking, uh, well, for, for uh, uh, on the futures thinking, we have concepts like systemic thinking, which is something that looks holistically at, at any issues, at context, at a problem. Um, it, it's, it also includes critical thinking because to look about the, at, at the future, we really need to think critically about what we're doing about it. And um, within that, it's also anticipatory thinking to anticipate what, what is coming. Um, so we're going to talk briefly uh, first about our, uh, the methods and tools. And then we're going to move to futures thinking. Uh, right, so there are hundreds of different uh, futures methods and tools out there. These are five of our favorite, uh, Tanya's and I favorite, but also the ones we've used in the community as well. Uh, and we're going to go very briefly over each one of those, uh, what are their, their purpose and characteristics. So the Futures Triangle is uh, designed by Sohail in Ayatollah. Uh, this is one of, one of our favorites because it's, quite, it's actually quite simple uh, and it helps you understand uh, the relationship between the present, the past and the future and why uh, the weights of the past or, or, or things that happened in the past may prevent us from getting to that future. Uh, this is quite simple to use and facilitate and it actually uh, puts you in the futures mindset. So this is one of the, the ones we like to use kind of at the beginning of things. And the second one is a futures wheel and um, I'm, I'm a designer. So this is kind of one of my favorites uh, for, for different reasons. Um, futures wheels is really good to look at implications of, of an issue uh, and it looks at implications direct implications, uh, but second order implication and third order implication, and in different sectors or areas. Um, the STEPV uh, is an acronym we utilize for social, technological, environmental, economical, political, and from values. So it really helps you look at the whole thing so that you don't, you don't miss an area. And in, it can be used in, in many different contexts uh, in design, um, et cetera. So um, going a bit faster, the causal layer analysis is one of a, a, a method by Sohail and Ayatollah, which we really like because as we can see here in the iceberg, it helps you open up the different layers and go, go to the root of the cause, systemic and the worldviews. On the three horizons, a method by Andrew Curie, Anthony Hodgson and Bill, Bill Sharps. Um, it's, it's a method that we really like uh, because it helps you look at the visions of the future and it bridges the today with the tomorrow with the second horizon, which is kind of the battlefield, like the, the in between what is happening now and in what's happening in the future. And we have finally the futures action model from Jose Ramos, which is a tool, as it, the name says, uh, for action. So it helps you kind of with, for, with uh, go broad and from the broad going into more detail to actual solutioning. So to create and design initiatives uh, that tackle actually these emerging futures and issues. And we'll exactly. go over to Tanya for, yeah. Uh, thank you, Graciela. And I will give you a short interview now about the second part that we talked about that is important if you want to become future literate, literate which is the future thinking. And it is important that you change your mindset and your point of views in order to see new things. Otherwise, you anticipate the future or you imagine the future only the way you know the past. And this is not how the future unfolds, as we recently see. So that's important that you stay curious and you act brave and that you welcome diversity. The more people you get from different backgrounds and cultures, the better you will see different images of the future and imagine different things because how we grow up and which stories we know is how we kind of like also look into the future. 
Um, also think crazy. There's not enough um, craziness um, to anticipate uh, or to think about because otherwise you won't see those pockets or those uncertain events uh, like a pandemic happen or even worse. Therefore, you can connect the dots and you need to think multidimensional. There is not one future. The future still unfolds. So we have to, to have to imagine those different pathways that lead into the future. So that's just a few um, yeah, ingredients uh, in your mindset that you need to get started. And this is important because um, we need to challenge our assumption bias. I did my master's of strategic foresight in Melbourne and Australia, and all my friends from Germany told me, oh, you go there, it's so dangerous. There are sharks and spiders and snakes who could kill you. And then otherwise they say, but enjoy those beautiful beaches, right? They are beautiful and amazing. But if you look actually at the numbers and you dig deeper, and I put those two numbers here next to you, the greater fear and danger is actually happening from the beaches. Because for the last the 10 years, so they're here, almost 10 years, they were listed here, um, 66 people died uh, out of a venomous or dangerous animal. Whereas 10,293 people died out of skin cancer in Australia because the, uh, the ozone hole there, the sun is so strong that being at the beach is actually the most dangerous thing. And that's probably nothing you would assume when thinking about Australia. So need to challenge your um, biases. The second is understand different point of views. Sometimes both can be right. It can be a six, it can be a nine. It's depending on your point of view. So try to understand if you meet someone that thinks differently than you, why? What is their background? What is their story? And why can they see the world differently? Because this helps you to think broader and imagine futures that you couldn't imagine before. Think outside the zone. So um, imagine you have a, a train company that most people would think, well, you're in the public transport because you're bringing people from A to B. But if you think broader, you could say you're competing with planes, with cars, by foot, by walking by foot. So you are in general in the mobility sector. But if you then broaden your, sc your um, scope, you would come up and say, why are people actually getting on your train? And what are, you, what are they doing there? So actually as a drain company you can be in the communication sector meaning that you need to bring people a to b to connect them or you need to give them a possibilities to connect while in the train and being a communication uh, company actually offers so much more possibilities than being in mobility or public transport and this is how you can think broader and come up with new ideas then it's also important to think about different images because how we imagine the future makes depends on our reflect reflects on our decisions today. So if you think that the future is going bad and there is only a pain and risk in the future, you will more likely see those signals in the present. And therefore it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy because prophecy because you will see those signals and then make your decision based on those leading ultimately into those negativity that you've imagined. So we almost need to force ourselves to think about better futures. How does it look like when we overcame or slow down climate change at least? How do we want to live together um, in more uh, symbiotic with the environment? And then you see those small pockets of signals of challenges and of opportunities in the present and you can help foster those positive pathways into the future. So we need to imagine multiple futures and especially the better ones because as Germans, as, as Germans, as human beings, especially as Germans, we love to be really risk adverse and, and looking for all the fears and that's happening. So um, yeah, be, be careful about this and try to imagine the good. So you also see the good in the present and can uh, foster this. And um, as a last approach for the thinking is um, you need to think about new approaches. So it used to be that we you'd need to go to wells and walk very far um, to go and collect water and some place on the earth you still have to. So we came up in the past to be solution driven and um, needed something to store water in order to not walk as often or to have it at home for safe. The second or the present then, or let's say in the 90s, uh, at least flashing Europe, um, um, people came up with the idea, well, if you put it in plastic bottles, we can just sell it faster, it's lighter to carry, and it's super a great idea without thinking of the consequences. So it was all about growth and market driven. We want the future to foster and to encourage you to think about the purpose. So this is a company um, that also was used during the Boston Marathon and they put uh, algae um, 
material, uh, plant-based material around water. So if you come back to the purpose that is actually about drinking water, then you just need to have water. You put it in your mouth and it pops and it's pure water. So we don't need the plastic bottle, uh, nor may even other uh, kind of like um, works or something to store if we came up with something why we actually do things. So we're thirsty, we want to drink. So let's go to this essence. And this is how you think about new approaches. And that's also how we came up with our community. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. So exactly. So we, we with Future Space, what we wanted to do is literally create a new approach to futures uh, in which we created this space, a space for collaboration, a space where uh, individuals, uh, individual independent practitioners, or also individuals, part of organizations could meet and could it could dis discuss, could challenge each other and could think about the future. Um, we started this last year in, in, um, in person. Uh, last year in 2019 here in Berlin with a partnership uh, with, a, with Beta House, a co-working space, where we invited people, people, newbies, most of them were newbies, all, all other people were also as part of innovation companies, mobility, but we were also, they were, uh, we invited some scientists looking at food innovation, and we put them all into a room to think about the future. In these different uh, events, workshops, we utilize all these different methods that we talked about before, and we started getting them into this, uh, this futures mode. Um, in, even though despite uh, Berlin being quite a diverse uh, city, we wanted to go big. We wanted to, uh, to go much more into um, um, diversity, which is where we decided to go online. And as of today, we are a global community with 500 plus members, 60 countries, 240 cities, and more than 45 areas of expertise, which is something that is, is and was, was and is very important for us because of this diversity of thinking, uh, thinking differently, like Tanya was explaining uh, a bit before. Um, so what we, um, we, the future, the future has been in the hands of a few people uh, before in, in, in our history. And we really think that it needs to be in the hands of more, more people. So we, we at Future Space uh, encourage you to, to ask different people, to talk to different people, listen to different people um, and, and, and be challenged with. And at the same time, work with the, all these different people because this is the people that are gonna bring you to these different uh, futures. Um, at Future Space, we also think in plural, we work within the area of participatory futures. Um, um, which is one of the reasons why we create this co-creation sessions. We invited a lot of our uh, members to co-create sessions for this UNESCO Literacy Summit. Uh, we remotely designed together these different sessions on futures of work, futures of future studies, and futures of social media. So we invite you all to uh, also participate in these ones. Um, exactly. And as um, said earlier, we all do this because we think there need to be more stories. They need to be different, more positive and inclusive. And for doing this, this can't be the future or the image of one or few visionary people out there. It needs to be community based. And we want to be this community to write those stories. And we're doing this through also gaming the future. So there are a lot of games to think about the future. And we do online play sessions uh, around this. So here we use the game. This is the thing from the future with the city Edition, where we ask for what can you create with three things um, that um, needs to be uh, in, in that. So here was about uh, ambitious company mobility and people came up with new battery ser services to uh, tackle the future's mobility or a cloth recycling center or a VR museum to understand the past and the future. So it is not always to complete those the full scenarios, but to create those small narratives and those ideas and pockets of change. And this can be wonderfully be done in, co in, in collaborative uh, gaming sessions. Um, and therefore we have then after those sessions and with the co-creation session, these alternatives that we thought before, because that's why we also call future space, the future's not written yet. So there are still those multiple pathways ready to explore. And we want to, yeah, kind of close with this and saying, um, we do not predict, prepare, react to the future, but we rather want to explore, map and act together. 
so that we can think and imagine those better futures. And this is um, what future literacy is there to create those numbers of pathways into the future that empower you in the present um, to foster those uh, better futures and create an environment we all want to live in. So yeah, in a nutshell, I'm, I'm we going bring to people interject to a little bit since you yeah. guys are still on the line, which is the, the, the questions we're getting in from the Q&A are all about mm -hmm. having access to these tools. We have three <laughs> questions saying basically the same thing. How do I yeah. how do I get both the deck, which we'll share after, uh, but also how do I use the tools? So if you want to speak That's a little bit to that. That brings me to, perfect, to the next slide, which is, so we are uh, the community that brings Trevor and create our own. And you can all join us on the community.futuresmoneyspace.com, which is, um, yeah, the community remains free. Um, we have a, a 30 days trial session for the uh, more advanced tools and methods. And um, for all the methods that we presented, you have a snippet explaining the core details of it. You have a template and you can watch a workshop uh, session. We will have more workshop sessions on this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the, the way to, to join and to interact and to be part of this movement, because we certainly create this for the members and next year, especially more members can interact and can share their opinions and their workshops and their methods. Great. Uh, thank you, Tanya and Graciela. Uh, are, are, are we done with uh, it's your last slide? Huh? Yes. Yes. OK, super. Great to to visit uh, the corridors of uh, your virtual platform huh? <laughs> in, on purpose <laughs> using visual images. Uh, um, Michelle, do we have any, I mean, we are a little bit past time. We were, we say 15 minutes each, we're a little bit longer. Do we take a couple, is there any relevant question, Michelle? No, I think we can go on. The, the, the questions are very specific. We can answer them all, um, in parallel. So if you want to go on with your bits, that's perfect. Good. Okay, so uh, now, Chara, the floor is yours. Let's go and visit Envisioning. Thanks, Rafael. Thanks, Future Space. I love the presentation. I hope you guys also liked as much as me. Uh, mm -hmm. So I will move forward to Envisioning then. So before we start, I would like to ask you again to join via care code uh, to our platform because this time uh, to present Envisioning's methodology, I will uh, be asking you guys a few questions and also you'll be interacting with our methodology to take a little bit of a grasp of how it is to be in this futures literacy space and how it is to be really uh, a futurist on the daily basis at Envisioning. So if you haven't joined with your care code, you can also go to highslides.com slash go beyond, which is also in our chat link. I guess we have a lot of people joined in, so it's going to be really fun. And my first question to you guys is actually, if you believe the future is accelerating, so let me know your ideas about. So until now, everybody is, yep, maybe, I guess we have a really cool crowd here which believes the future is accelerating because we are, after all, on the, uh, on the Futures Literacy UNESCO Summit. So yeah, most people do believe the future is accelerating. Awesome. And secondly, do you believe technology is the key driver for these changes? So you do, believe, do you believe technology is somehow connected to the changes we have been living into now? So a lot of people believe that as well, I see. And well, also does Envisioning. So Envisioning is a platform for emerging technologies. Our, we are a future studies uh, community what we do is basically to capture hundreds of emerging technologies, assess them, analyze them, and then create new future scenarios in which our clients, which are actually mainly governments and uh, companies which want to understand more about the future. And what they do is basically to use our tools to build their own futures. 
And we are, we are based all over the world. Actually, Envisioning is 100% based online. We have always been, even before the pandemic. So uh, we have people all over the world, but mainly Brazilians as myself and Michelle and also Gaudino, which is also from Envisioning as a research fellow. Uh, so we are a global community of people. And what we do, uh, as I've said, we build tools based on emerging technologies to talk about the future. I will show you briefly one of our projects so you can really get in touch of what exactly I'm talking about. So Envisioning builds these uh, radar tools, which are a collection of emerging technologies. This one, for example, is about the future of cities. What we did here is that we gathered emerging technologies from all over the world, uh, and we comprise them in this visualization tool in which you can see not only hundreds of emerging technologies, but understand exactly their redness level. So if they are still in this stage of an idea, they will be uh, far beyond the center. If, in, if they are um, a more of a product, they are almost there uh, to, to be used by the public. They are more located in the center. And you can uh, search here, what are the future perspectives for all these emerging technologies, how they connect to each other, what is the sustainable development goals in which they are playing on, new sources, organizations, and everything you can think about emerging technologies. But we not only map and analyze these technologies, we also create narratives around them. So our methodology is basically to gather all these emerging technologies and see how they connect and what stories they could they, could they make in the future. So for example, this is one of those, which is data quizzy, which is basically a uh, future in which instead of uh, the use of politics, uh, we can use data to uh, create a more democratic society in a way. And we describe this scenario here in which all these technologies will emerge and somehow will change the future. And this is used mainly by companies to make uh, decision making and also to uh, use as a basis for prototyping and innovation. So you are probably wondering how we come up with this and our, what is our methodology to build this tool. So I will give you a quick look on envisioning sketching and how we make everything uh, happen. So first of all, I would like to give you a few premises about how envisioning look at the future. Uh, so first of all, thinking about technology, we believe technology is created by humans to solve problems. So in this way, we don't think that technology is only the things that break when we, um, when they don't work, you know, that, that it's not only the things that break when we need them, but it's basically everything that humans have ever uh, built to solve problems. So for example, the English language can be considered a technology because it's a way of communicating. Uh, agriculture can also be considered a technology because it's a way that we made to make us more sustainable and then to uh, have these two uh, to, to be used to work on our futures. Our second premise is that emerging technologies help us understand social changes. So if you think, for example, if you could know that the elevator would uh, emerge, you could probably also think that we would have higher buildings in the cities and probably more people would be able to believe in, the, in them. And this could uh, help you, uh, you see even before the elevator is created that we could be having a much harder urbanization in urban centers. And finally, we believe that technologies don't die, they evolve. So uh, for example, if you think of um, organic organisms which die and all their genes die with them, technologies, they don't die like uh, uh, living organisms do because there are ideas, they can only evolve. So for example, Uber can die as a company in a few years but not the sharing economy. So we track technologies and not companies, not products, but the technologies, the ideas per se. And how we track these technologies, how we map these technologies are through a variety of uh, tools and sources. So we look uh, 
to uh, we look for technologies from ideas on science fiction. So, for example, we watch hundreds of movies and um, uh, games um, and other sci-fi chronicles and articles to get a chance to understand what people are looking at on science fiction and try and then try to understand if this can become a reality or not or even feel how people are uh taking these technologies on their their daily lives are they afraid of these technologies or are they excited about them we also look at academic articles, patents, crowdfunding platforms, and media articles to grasp and map these emerging technologies. We have an amazing team of researchers all over the world who uh, do that for us inside our database. And depending on the how far in the future we want to look, we look at different sources of emerging technologies. So for example, if you want to see technologies that are already uh, products, we see technologies on the media that are or pro or prototypes. If you want to see technologies that are still early on their uh, development stages, we go to academic articles and patents, for example. And now a quick game for us to play here. If you were a futurist in envisioning and you would be looking to the future of cities, for example, which technology would you think that matters the most, that could most impact cities in the future? and that you would add into one of our radars. Let's see what you guys think. So we have vertical farms here, uh, which are basically farms that are completely automated and can be used inside urban centers. We have blockchain notary, which is basically a way to uh, end all bureaucracy, uh, physical bureaucracy, let's say. We have also drone highway, which is uh, way in the future where we have so many drone deliveries that we need a highway of drones so they can uh, uh, plane inside cities. Also police robots uh, and unsurveillance fashion for you don't get recognized with facial recognition tools such as the ones which are already happening. So I see that most people voted on vertical farms, which I think it's a great chance as well. I would do this as well. All of these technologies, by the way, are in the Future of Cities uh, website, which you can um, access afterwards and check it out. So we will be playing with vertical farm here and trying to understand a little bit more about this technology throughout our session now, since you guys picked this one. So as uh, these five technologies that I've presented to you. We also map hundreds of emerging technologies inside our database. I will give you a quick look on how this database is presented. It's really our kitchen here, guys, so please don't mind the mess. <laughs> uh, as I've said, we have hundreds of emerging technologies already mapped, and they are all uh, standardized. Uh, they have pictures and also organizations linked to them in all uh, other ways of assessment. We have our projects here. So basically, you have a database for all these emerging technologies. That is what I was I wanted to show to you. And after we map all these emerging technologies for a certain subject, we do the assessment of them, which is basically trying to go deeper in each one of them and really try to understand them. And the first thing we do with all the technologies is to, is to access the technology readiness level of them. So how ready they are. Are they still on the science fiction level or they are already a science fact? This is very important because then we can grasp not only how they are now, but how much they are accelerating. Are they moving fastly on their TRL scores or they are really moving slowly and we can only see them in a couple of uh, decades. So for vertical farms, I want you to vote now. Do you think this technology is still in the phase of idea or would you think this technology is already a product, is already ongoing? So I would really like you to vote now. So we have most people voting on two products, but also some people are still on idea stages. Remember that for accessing 
emerging technologies in our database to see the tech the technology readiness level we always look on the on a technical term so it doesn't really matter how much diffusion this technology has but if it's ready on a technical level so inside a lab is that completely fully on or not so most people already think it's around 7.3 which is between prototype and product and you're completely right about that it's kind of this range that this range that we also access them these technologies and envisioning uh used uses not only this scale of around ideas and product but we use trls which uh, which is a scale from one to nine which was developed firstly by nasa to assess uh rocket ships and see their stage of development we actually got this uh, concept that nasa uses and we developed a way to use this scale throughout all emerging technologies we have on our our database so we basically go from basic principles observed and reported uh, for example in a science fiction trl one and goes up to nine which is actual systems already proven and operating and this is not only cool for us to understand uh the degree of evolution of a technology so it features 4.1 or 2.2 for us this is really not what it's most important but what is really interesting is that with this scale we can compare emerging technologies and really see from these hundreds of emerging technologies we have which ones are more uh developed than the others and really be able to compare them and analyze them other scale that we also do is the sustainability impact, which we will find is very important. We have developed this with GIZ. And basically, when we analyze the sustainability impact of a technology, we look at four uh, different vectors, which is how, what is the economic impact of this technology, what is the ecological impact, the social impact, and also the political impact. We find these four layers of sustainability very important, and these are the vectors in which we analyze every single one of our technologies. So I would like you, uh, also like you to uh, uh, review the sustainability impact that you think vertical farms uh, could have in the future. So please let me know what is the social impact that vertical farms will have in the future, in your opinion. What is the economical impact, the environmental impact, and also the political impact? Let's see if we can do this together. So I see that most people think that vertical farms would have an amazing, very positive uh, social impact and environmental impact. And while the political impact is more on a neutral scale, and the economic impact would also be positive as well as the social one. Amazing. What we do actually inside Envisioning is ask, ask experts on sustainability the exactly same question. And what we do is not only to ask them what is the social impact, what is the economic impact, but we actually actually have dimensions of economical impact, dimensions of ecological and social and political impact. So for example, if you're analyzing uh, the ecological impact or the, the economical impact, for example, we look also into employment. So is this technology going to create more jobs or not? Is this creating a regenerative economical systems in which all people are included. So every one of these dimensions, every one of these vectors have different questions in which we analyze them and then we create this harmonic means between all the, the answers and have the sustainability impact of a single technology. So what this means is that uh, for, and I will just quickly review to you one of our presentations, one of our projects we did with GIZ, uh, which is, I guess uh, we have changed the link for this one. But basically for GIZ, what we did was to analyze all these emerging technologies through the vectors I've just uh, stated to you guys. And apart from 
readiness score. Apart from sustainability impact, we also do a lot of other assessments. So for example, we do have a metric to understand the local implications of a determined technology or how would this impact, for example, regulation, law enforcement, and a, a variety of local metrics. So we, we want to localize these technologies as well. We have personalized metrics in which we create, especially for our clients, in which tell, for example, how familiar they are with these technologies or how much these technologies could create innovation or disruptive uh, disruptions around their companies. We also have tech systems in which we can basically tag all these emerging technologies and create uh, even uh, more accessible tools for the people who are using them. And for a more qualitative part of these assessments, we have expert interviews, workshops, and of course, desk research. Workshops happen in a variety of ways. We use workshops not only to gather insights from people, like we're doing now, but also we use workshops to, uh, as an educational tool to help people not only see the emerging technologies and the scenarios, but create their own scenarios and uh, understand really deeply on how these technologies could affect their own lives in the future. Thank you, Tiara. I think it would be nice to, I think we're getting a ton of questions in the background. I think it would be nice to hear from Rafael. Um, and then we'll address the questions towards the end so we can stay to the, stick to the schedule. Okay, should we take a couple, uh, one question or two or? I think the questions are happening end? in parallel. I would sum them up at the end. So I would, I would recommend Rafael, if you wanna if, speak to your experience and methodologies and then we'll summarize the questions towards the end. We're also answering them in parallel, but there's a, there's a ton of, of Discussion. I have just a couple of slides to finish. Maybe I should finish before we go to questions. Yeah. Okay, just go very quickly because we're already past time, but um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So finally, when we have all these technologies mapped and we analyze every single one of them through these metrics and qualitative assessments, we go and cluster them. What does this mean? It means that we basically gather these emerging technologies and put them into lists. So which technologies could correlate and create somehow a different future? That's what we do inside our, uh, our workspace. And we gather futurists from uh, all backgrounds you can think of to really grasp these images of the future and create these future scenarios. And that's what really the magic is because uh, you can have these emerging technologies and tell stories around them from so many different perspectives, like Tanya and Graciela were uh, saying during their in their speak their speech. Um, and well, I should have uh, downloaded this sooner. Okay, this is it. So this is basically our tool, which functions much like a Trello board. Just downloading again because it redownloaded. Mm. Or maybe we can go back on that after, or. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Well. So, should we go to the questions then? Yeah, or. Uh, um... Maybe may I make my present because we are a little bit uh, past time now. It's like already 10 to noon. So I will make my presentation and then we can engage in a, in a collective uh, discussion and address the question. No? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Raphael. Let's just uh, do that. And then the, the conversation can be open between us and, and the audience. And the later. audience. Okay. So let me share my screen. Here is my press. Okay. Um, Let's go full screen. Uh, and uh, presentation. Okay. So, um, hello everyone again. So, uh, Lead Future Lab is a little bit of a different story. Lead Future Lab is a research platform, a foresight research platform I created 20 years ago. And uh, um, it is a, it is a, it started as an art project. But maybe let, I should go back even before 
to just share also the way I've been start when I started to explore the future in the 90s when I was working on a trading floor in finance and I was working on oil markets and on oil markets uh, and financial markets you you produce a future vision on a daily basis so it's like I think it's my, like it's a very important first experience I had in terms of foresight is how you use the future uh, on a trading floor you design future visions as much to manage risk to but also to sell to your clients so there is and every day you change of your mind you process a lot of information you have metrics you have uh, correlations you have uh, all kind of reports under, uh, under your hand, but you also have like a buoyant imagination and a subjective point of view. So it was clear from the beginning that the future was something that was partially rationalizable with data, with metrics, with indicators, um, but also it had a big part of imagination. And so my presentation might be very much at the crossroad between envisioning and uh, future space uh, with this vision, with no, this notion of a uh, creating the future. So that was in the 90s. And then I also had an art practice. And uh, so it's more as an artist that I created Lead Future Lab because I wanted to have an art-based research platform to explore how creativity and an artistic way of thinking could contribute to the world transformation. So it started by having collaboration with companies, which was my first um, uh, bridge, I would say, crossing art and business. And so LEED started as a, um, a helping companies to design their futures. Uh, because my art practice was also relating to cities, very quickly I added this urban dimension and LEED started to develop urban research project. And then after that, I started to be invited by academia, universities to share my methods, my research project, and so it became a knowledge production platform. So this is a story of a Lead Future Lab, which remains a very hybrid foresight research platform with consulting in the design of what I call future labs uh, that we customize for each of our clients, our academic collabs um, to do, to have an R&D on uh, uh, like the four pillars that I mentioned, business, urban design, knowledge, and the cultural field. So those four big ecosystems are where we do experiments and we do produce knowledge and consulting. Uh, so academic collaborations, uh, also always art experiments, uh, art experiment to also explore formats, formats of knowledge, formats of research, um, weak signal um, also as like the, 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 the art world as being a, a sphere of reinvention of our imaginaries. So it's not so much uh, based on technologies, but also on imaginaries, representation, images. Uh, the art world remains a very buoyant uh, uh, sphere to explore the future. Uh, and so also, be, so uh, the, the, the practice of LEAD is a little bit of a uh, personal adventure and a collaborative ad adventure with companies, cities, and uh, universities. Uh, so today I'm going to, okay, share very quickly. Uh, let me, okay, uh, sorry. Okay, uh, there is a little bug of a, on my presentation. Okay, so when we, decide, when we design Future Lab for companies, cities, universities, or cultural places, we mix ingredients, which are content that we provide, future trend reports, collaborative methods, and creative formats. So a future lab is a combination of each of those parameters. I'm not going to go so deep into those experiences because I really want to zoom on few extremely like uh, uh, more experimental cases uh, that I've been able to experiment in the last 20 years. Uh, so regarding future trend reports, I can say that at LEAD, we have, we have also served as an R&D uh, platform for other um, advisory firms, such as Peclers. Uh, we've done future trend report for them on future of cities, future of uh, uh, societal innovation, future of uh, collaborative economy. Um, uh, so this is like a, a kind of historical collaboration of, uh, of lead. Um, uh, also, um, uh, future of fa fabrication and factories. So always in this crossroad of business, knowledge, uh, culture, 
and urban transformation. Um, I can uh, answer to your question uh, on, the, on those uh, topics um, uh, later on, uh, when we also we provide inspirational scenario that are based on more weak signal and a lot of creativity. So we do not, in fact, use the classic foresight methods. Uh, it's more like this creative process of combining knowledge, inspiration, images. It's more like a, 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 a in, in house methods that I'm going to share with you also by showing uh, this case. So this is uh, the ecosystem of all the, the companies, cities, universities, and cultural places we have worked with in the last 20 years. Um, so uh, I can mention, for instance, the, the, the Shanghai World Expo that was extremely interesting. Uh, uh, it's project uh, um, that I did with, uh, with the Tongji University in China, uh, the city of Montevideo also uh, to design the, uh, the, the art neighborhood of the city, uh, Galerie Lafayette to explore uh, the future of, our, of retail with, uh, um, uh, with influence of art and culture. Um, but let's go now. I would like to zoom on a, a, a project that has been leads uh, uh, quite uh, important R&D, which is a project about the future of the greater Paris. Um, it's called Paris Galaxies. And this project, it's like we started it as a, you know, as an in-house uh, uh, research and development project uh, in 2008, which was the moment the, the French government was initiating um, uh, a process to shift from Paris as a small capital with a giant invisible suburb. Uh, Paris is 2.5 million inhabitants inside the inside Paris, and then it's 11 million people with the suburb. So it's a giant, silent suburb in the uh, uh, in the in the back of the of the metropolis. And so, making the Greater Paris is this idea of becoming a joint metropolis with the in, inside Paris and the periphery. And for that project, um, I thought it's such a giant, uh, um, it's such a giant case. It's a hyper complex uh, uh, challenge. There is also a dramatic cultural divide between the inside and the outside. So it's a political issue. It's an urban design issue. It's an uh, economic issue because there is a lot of poverty outside while inside Paris, I mean, Paris is one of the richest cities in the world. Um, so it was a really multidimensional, hyper complex project. So that's how it started as a, as a challenge. Like how can we tackle the future of the greater Paris? And Paris Galaxy started like that. And then it developed as an academic research our, our project with Sorbonne University, where we won our big academic research grant. Um, so the project was hosted in the art and design research department of Sorbonne University. And around that core partnership, then we installed an ecosystem of partnership with other schools, uh, architecture school, um, uh, um, sustainable development, uh, design, graphic design, um, um, uh, design management, uh, art management. Uh, we installed a web of a collaborative experiment to design also uh, to customize creative research methods to address the future of the Greater Paris at different horizon. So I'm not going, I mean, it's a long story, huh? it's 10 years. The website, you have it at the bottom of my slide, parisgalaxies.net shows all the episodes of that research platform. And on that slide, you have a little bit of an overview of the, the exhibition, the workshop, the conferences. It's more the, the, the panorama. Now, uh, I'm going to zoom on one of the episodes of that large project, which was called Par Grand Paris Future Lab. And with that uh, uh, cycle of what it's, it's a future camp, uh, we, we did it with a uh, the CNAM, which has a, a, a master in uh, foresight and innovation with the architecture school um, and with students from masters in all our joint uni academic um, uh, uh, platform because uh, the, all those schools are part of the ESAM uh, joint uh, academic um, uh, network. And, uh, in this future camp, we had like 25 students from transdisciplinary 
student and, and researchers. Uh, it was hybrid between pedagogy and research. We explore the future of the Greater Paris at a horizon that, of 150 years. How can we design future vision of this metropolis at such a distant horizon? And for this exercise, this, we staged a research process in this giant room. So you see it's like a, this, it was like a 400 square meters room and the students uh, and groups were working on tables uh, on the top uh, image of the, uh, uh, on the two smaller images, you see the, 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 the research space. And at the end of the camp, we were transforming the space into an exhibition space and we were inviting our, our foresight expert to engage in a collaborative discussion around each of the production of the students. So it was like how to be like I have like in a five days uh, a future camp, how can we uh, come up with um, uh, future visions that are not given in PowerPoints or in lectures, but really have visual boards so that we could interact and continue the research together. So in the room, we had also a giant mood board, which is on the left, this giant wall of images, because a, a large part of the, of the process was also to look at the past. It was looking backward at 150 years ago. So let me show this uh, 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 visual board is all the images that the student had as a source of inspiration uh, at the beginning. And those images were futuristic representation of the city from late 19th century, early uh, um, 21st century, as a, a way also to, to cultivate a critical distance to the way we address the future. Like, look at how those futuristic vision are in a way already dated, but today we are continuing producing those sci-fi uh, representations. So how can we keep a, a, a smart, uh, uh, a smart distance on um, the way we work? So those was in inspirations. That was a giant mood board where students had to collect weak signal, inspirational images. Also having an exercise of conceptualization. Are um, all uh, in a in a collective confrontation and collective intelligence, and so that was a visual, uh, the future panorama. So it's not it's not designing scenarios. It's more like having the future as a as a, a as a panorama of information that is adjustable. And I'm not going to go into the details, but it's like really using visual representation and large scale uh, representation so that you can have like a synthetic vision of a complex issue in one visual board. So this is like one of, like a, one of the most, uh, like I would say, uh, 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 challenging experience because 150 years ago is, is really definitely a challenge. And we can also see all the, the fears and the hopes that, uh, uh, that are implicit to those representation. Uh, but now I'm going to, uh, uh, because in that, uh, in that uh, workshop, uh, the, in the introduction, we were also giving some insight about what is the Greater Paris and some pedagogy about uh, um, that specific case of the Greater Paris so that we would be very site specific. And part of this is also a, a, a tool that I designed at the beginning of the Paris Galaxy project. I started it as a more as a, as a matrix, conceptual matrix to try to understand how this future panorama is moving. How do can we organize our mental representation of the future? And this conceptual diagram is, is one of the practice of lead of like also using visual maps to try to keep a synthetic representation and really not, not a visual representation, but more how can we design mental maps, like something that help us to have clarity in our head and also to understand how we can value the information we collect. And so this conceptual diagram, it's inspired by visual representation of uh, astrophysicians, how they, they map the sky to understand how objects interact and how they move. And so I use that, uh, that visual tool as a, as, a, as a test to see how we could modelize the transformation of the metropolis. The case of the Greater Paris, which is, which is this giant case and hyper complex case, and also 
it could serve also for other cities in the end. So it's more like using that tool for me. In many cases, I realize also it was extremely pedagogic and it could really help students and like new, new uh, uh, people who were not educated in urban design to, to, to really forge themselves an understanding of the complexity of the city. So it, it's organized as four layers. The, the one in the back is the urban shape the actual form of the city, the urban design, the architecture, which is actually changing not very quickly. It's quite, it's a slow, it's very anchored. It's on the ground. It is the ground. It, it's our, our formal uh, uh, um, living space and it doesn't change very quickly. It's every, you know, when you build a building, it's here for decades. So this, this uh, urban shape is the first layer. The second layer, is the institutional uh, uh, architecture, the, uh, the borders of uh, municipalities, region departments, legal frames. This is very anchored. It's very attached to the ground and it doesn't change very often either. It's very, st it's structuring the city also. It's not very visible because when you cross the, 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 the limit between two municipalities, you're not necessarily aware of it. But it's extremely uh, st it's structuring the city and it's tr and it's changing at a fairly slow rhythm also. So that's the second layer, and that's also where you can kind of it's in this slide that you can you can also understand how politicians are thinking. The first the first dimension is like you would have like the input of urban designers, architects, um, uh, mobility infrastructures. You would have like the, the knowledge of those uh, those skills like classified in that uh, slide. So design, urban design, uh, political uh, checker. The third slide is less anchored on the ground and it's more like a mixed program of social use. And on that slide, uh, on that layer, uh, it's changing much faster. It's more fluid change. It's not so much on the ground. You can work in a place, but you can actually in a very quick time decide to work somewhere else. So it's, it's more like the ecosystem of the city, how social use get organized, and it's more a palette of mixed use that, are, that we should be thinking as, a, an, a, as an ecosystem. And the fourth layer, which, is, um, which I'm very picky to work on, is the immaterial dimension of the city with knowledge, imaginaries, culture, and of course, a digital layer, which is extremely rapidly changing also. So if we Thank are on the Rafael, yellow dot. I, I'm gonna, I wanna open up to questions a little bit because we have about 20 minutes left. And I think there's, there's, there's so much conversation going on in the back channels. We've, um, and I think there, there's questions related to each one of the panels. Um, yep. So I'm going to finish with, uh, with this. And from, from this slide, uh, yeah, um, uh, I will complete. It's also the, that same mat layering matrix that I've used in that other part of the project, which is a book, Paris Ars Universalis. It's a, it's a future fiction telling a story of the greater Paris at the horizon of 2035. So it's a design fiction experiment, also built at the layering uh, process where you navigate through the, uh, the, the, the dimension. But also this book, it's not, it's not one narrative, it's also a foresight manual explaining how each of those layers are transforming. So it's not just like, it's not one strategy, it's more like a, 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 guide, a guideline to address the future and also keep this very holistic perspective and multi-layered with a big focus on the immaterial. So I will stop here. I could, you know, I, I use those visual map on many other cases such as like the future of economy. This is a project with IFTF or like also when I do or like advocacy campaigns such as this one, I'm always using those systemic representation in the back to try to modelize the future, uh, not using the, the regular uh, uh, foresight tools, but more like customizing uh, uh, representation and uh, conceptual uh, frames to address the future. So I will stop here and I'm, I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, in the chat. Thank you very much. That's it. Yeah. So we have, I mean, we have several threads that have been answered. What I want to do though, is if anyone wants to join the panel and ask questions on video, because we have the back channel, I think that's working and I'm, I'm trying to address all the, uh, the many questions. 
But if you, if you want to raise your hand as a participant or as an attendee, so if we're having Philip, I'm going to promote a few people as panelists, and then we'll have uh, other um, voices joining the conversation. And if you, again, if you raise your hand, we'll invite you in as a panelist, and you'll reconnect, and we'll get to see you, and you get to ask your questions on video. Hi, Philip. Hi there. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very interesting and, um, and uh, inspirative set of um, observations, indeed. I, just have a, I will be a sort of a devil's advocate in relation to um, two specific things um, that were part of, um, I'm very sorry, I'm, 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 I'm not very good in pronouncing names correctly, uh, Graciela and Tiara. Uh, when you raise the, um, the, 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 the whole notion where the future is accelerating, uh, can you elaborate on this a little bit more? Because for me, as someone who's been, um, who is a sociologist of time, um, this is a this is a quite a complicated sort of um, concept, if you wish. So that's one thing. If I may ask for a further elaboration, what exactly do you mean by that? And the second point is that um, when you when you were talking about uh, whether uh, technologies in one way or another determine the future or will determine the future. Well, um, the thing is that within the science and technology studies, that is a field that I also happen to uh, follow quite um, 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 in depth, um, that would imply technological determinism, which is, um, uh, there is an old, uh, an STS has proven that um, technologies in and of themselves do not really um, determine human or social uh, history. Uh, it's always the designers, engineers, users, owners of the particular technology and the interminglings between these these various actors, but also non-human actors such as regulations that are that are attendant to these technologies, uh, shaping uh, how this particular technology is used, will be used, and um, and by extension will co-shape our present and our futures. So that's just the, the first is a, is a more of a question. The second is a sort of a complementary, um, I don't want to call it clarification, I, would, I wouldn't dare so, but uh, maybe just a complementary perspective uh, to what you've just said, but thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Philip, so much. Um, I, I, I probably let, let Chiara also answer this uh, from Envisioning side, but I would say, yes, the example that I showed from Rapid Change is is one example that is that is maybe easier for for us here in this audience to grasp the change from our desk right the video um uh, but but for sure i'm also like a, a people person my background is in design and and at future space we do consider the the people the creators of the technologies and with the with itself kind of the the ones that have the power to change this this is a whole a whole uh, other topic about like agency and what Tanya mentioned briefly about images of the future, the more you, you image and visualize, you start acting one way, which means uh, you're shaping the future in itself. Um, so, so that's kind of my take on that. Okay, understood, thank you. Yeah, if, I may, if I may also answer to uh, this notion of agency, because also like uh, there is a tendency today to really search to empower people and give them agency. I think it's ex it's it's excellent, but also it's important to uh, not fall into that dreamy pre uh, vision of like yeah we could just do whatever and everything could be possible. A lot of things could be possible, but it's still important to have a kind of understanding of uh, the forces that are in process. Like uh, you know there is just like this this in injunction to creativity also. Like you have to be creative and you have to design new things and you have to you know be the future of your dream. But in fact, uh, 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 there is some limits and there is some also you know uh, there 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 are constraints. And it's still important to have an understanding of what is moving around so that uh, it doesn't become a, a disappointment of uh, just like uh, 
for instance, like the, the economic care, uh, sector is in deep crisis at the moment and to renew the economy, uh, it's not so simple, you know, it's like, so it's, there is topics where, well, it's not just about dreaming about it. It's also like a very, it's also super tricky questions. So a little bit of knowledge and, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, pedagogy is also very important, I think. I think it's part of the literacy of the future literacy is this dual, this subtle balance between pedagogy and empowerment. Regarding your question, Philip, I hope I, I uh, pronounce your name correctly. Uh, yeah, Philip. Uh, regarding the future is accelerating. My objective with this question was really to grasp how people were feeling in our conversation today. So it's not, uh, it's a philosophical question in which I believe most people feel that the, the changes are accelerating, that things used to move slower than it is today. And I wanted to understand if people had this feeling as well. So it's not much a technical term about the future is accelerating. It's not a statement, but it's really to grasp how people are feeling towards the future. If it's accelerating, if it's, everything is the same old, same old, you know? So this, the first one, it was really to, the, this first question was really to inspire people into really think if it's really important to look at the future, if it's accelerating, it's even more important to look at it. So I hope this answers your first question. Absolutely. Now I, I, I probably uh, understand a bit more uh, um, uh, uh, what you meant by that. So it was meant uh, as more, uh, um, in a sort of a phenomenological sort of sense, you know, like the, the immediate perception of, of, you know, what comes to your mind when this question is, is actually sort of articulated and how you would immediately react, you know, from your subjective phenomenological, almost cognitive perspective. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. No worries. And regarding your, uh, your question about emerging technologies, I would just like to highlight that we also see that the future is not made by technologies. Technologies are the, just tools that humans use in a variety of ways, depending on their backgrounds and uh, their belief systems. Uh, but we understand that emerging technologies and technologies that will be used in the future could, it's a hint, is a grasp of how things could work in the future. And of course, a technology is not a the term uh, to that we will make people behave in a certain way or not. It's just um, a signal of what could happen. So for example, if you could go to the future, what would you bring to the present to, that could represent it? You know? And we think that although we cannot understand yet how people will behave or what they will think or what they will believe, we can see what tools will they be using and imagine how they will be using it, how this will change their belief systems. And it's very important to also state that we don't make predictions. We don't have crystal balls. What we do is basically to see the, the signals of the futures and create future scenarios, which could be uh, very, very diverse. And also our main objective is not only to create these scenarios, but to create this systems thinking this futures thinking on uh, people's minds so they can not only understand or not, not only understand, but grasp the future, but understand the consequences of the present, which is even more important for our today's ages. So uh, futurism, futures thinking, it's not about predicting the future, but understand the consequences of the present and really grasp the sense of what we're doing uh, with, with society as a whole. So I hope this answers your question and thank you very much Today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Tiara, if I can comment on what you say and, and to bridge with what uh, Tanya and uh, Graciela said also, like the, 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 the mental exercise of looking at the future, those uh, like the future thinking, uh, it's extrapolating from the present. And it's also like, as the uh, um, future space says, uh, like how to, can we also jump in alternative visions? And uh, it's this uh, that's why I, mean, I, I, I speak more of like future uh, dynamic panoramas, 
uh, because it's like a you have a blurry horizon it's changing but so you need to, to find a way of how to design in your head some kind of like representational system that is moving along the you know the amount of information that you get the understanding that you got of your surrounding it's more having this blurry uh, uh in in mental representation system that you can interact with. And, and the more you use it the more you, you, the the picture becomes accurate in a way uh, but it's still a speculative bubble. I mean, for sure, there is no way we can predict the future. Still, there is a mega trend that we can absolutely understand, such as, for instance, uh, 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 we spoke about the future of work. The trend now of like demonetizing work, it's something that is really uh, like a, um, there is a tendency to demonetize work. So that's, for instance, like a core trend that we see. Uh, it's part of the uberization of the economy. It's part of the grassroots mechanism. It's part of the collective spirit that we have in the society so you know there there are some big trends that we need to have in our head and so it's a mixture between understanding present movements and uh and how can we at some point have a, a feeling of certainty it's it's an illusion because there is no way we have a certainty but we have a feeling of certain certainty that allows to take action and this is really when you spoke about belief systems, and it's really what what it what a belief system is. At some point, you have like a sense of certainty, and it's a pure fiction that we tell in our head. That's why art is interesting about this kind of ambiguous uh, sense of reality. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think Raphael, that just to an artist now, and so then I will give it to Jochen because I think uh, he has a question. Uh, that is also important that trends are still something that we visualize in the present, and uh, therefore it is important, as you said, to challenge our mindset and our uh, bias and belief system so we can actually imagine different futures. And yeah. I believe we can do this even with um, with more difficult topics like the economic system if we tend to go farther out and really imagine how the world would be in 10 or 20 years and then then bring it back. Uh, but uh, hello, Jochen, and <laughs> thanks for joining. Hello. So I would like to. No, I'm so happy your... that I'm able to join you and I'm impressed about the quality, the arguments. I think I'm a dream team in this <laughs> session. Um, I have a question because I have a long way from biochemistry, so biophilosophy, cultural philosophy, to finally a PhD in medical history because I met a strange guy who tried to use aesthetics to rediscover the early modern times in Europe to create a new digital medicine. And he died and nobody has been his successor. So my question is a little bit, because um, who, who was talking now before me, very impressive, Raphael, I think. She impresses me quite a lot. I found like him a lot of nice um, things in the past and you just said, mentioned visu um, visualize. I think the early money times have been very strong. I'm just reading now articles about Robert Flood, a guy from 17th century who was an encyclopedist, but a spiritual encyclopedist. And another one is Athanasius Kircher, a Jesuit who um, before um, uh, Napoleon discovered the Egyptology, the hieroglyphs uh, understanding, are they people in your expert circle already integrating a little bit of history some things who started to be developed, which stopped, for example, Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Gustav Jung, they thought about synchronicity in order to avoid pure mechanistic thinking. What do you think about this? Well, uh, there's I, a whole discipline, sorry. And uh, there's yeah, a whole okay. discipline about it that is called uh, big history. So if you go uh -huh. into what uh, Joseph Warwers, for example, um, it's one of my professors at Swinburne University, he's teaching big history and really looking back from the Big Bang till now to see patterns and what we can learn from them in order to uh, learn more about the future. Um, and this is a big part as we presented with the Futures Triangle, the present, the past belongs to the future. So we have to always understand all of them. Swinburne yeah. University? Swinburne, yeah, it's in Melbourne, Swinburne of Technology. Uh, Melbourne, wow, the Australians, yeah, they are creative, mm. my God. Mm -hmm. And if I can comment also on your question, thank you for this great question. Uh, yeah, it's like to, to, to work on the future, like you absolutely have to look at the past to just understand whole, also how what you consider as 
re the reality we are part of has been a construct through time. And me, I, I look at the history of art because I think representation is so important. And for medicine, actually, the, an amazing project with the Center for Molecular Medicine in, uh, in Stockholm, like 15 okay. years ago. Uh, and uh, so I looked at the history of medicines also, of how we've been like through time opening the body from like the, the skin, the flesh, the organs, the cell, the, and then the, the, the molecular scale. And we're continuing to dig into that. So it's also like this visual dimension that is really important in medicines. And I mean, we could have a, uh, like a, you can take my email and we can engage yes, in Yes, I would love, love that. to. I'd be very happy. But yeah, the, the history of, of art, the history of science and technology is also something that I look at, the history of economy, just to understand how like each of the system we have gone through are the result of a, of certain belief of certain value systems and uh, so it's going backward going backward is a source of inspiration to see what can move in fact uh, there do you is know this catalog do you know oh uh, yeah thing? actually i actually are uh, uh, you know, in the in the book I wrote about the future of the Greater Paris, there is a, a diagram of Raymond Lula in it. Uh, that oh, it's you know like... this? My God, I met the right people. My God, <laughs> most people don't know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me show. Uh, yeah, the Raymond I want to upvote. Uh, so the most the most now. requested uh, question in the in the comments is about the relationship between art inspiration and forecasting. So the use of art in 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 casting futures, Perfect. and I think we can try we can try. Taking a tangent away from the uh, from the epistemological questions of technology and look at the, the role of art. Does anyone want to speak to that? I mean, I, I, I can just say a brief because I saw the question about the, how companies take it to to look at art. I think companies they are they are uh, w depends what their what their uh, job. If they are in a very tech oriented uh, uh, field, they might be looking mostly at innovation. But still, they need to have an understanding of like what are the values behind and to understand values and mental representation. Art is actually a very good uh, source to just also put your head on. And so even though they're not necessarily looking for art, uh, as, I mean, me as a foresight expert, I'm always bringing some art elements on the table just to help them reach that more immaterial dimension and imaginary level. So, you know, it's all, it's like how you, you, you manage your, your little crowd. Oh, it's like whether it's through a platform or your client or a team of students, it's like, you know, you bring on the table certain things, you engage in a collective creative research. I say creative research because we always put some of our personal projection and our bias, all of us, whatever our, your, the amount of degree you have. And uh, so art is a very good uh, ingredient to challenge your representation, look at your personal subjective preferences and I'm going and, to stop here. Yeah, Raphael, if I may I may add know. briefly to the to the art and design piece, I think in art and design are very powerful for futures because they, they don't they don't only serve as tools to envision and, and visualize these these potential futures, but in a way they 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 can also bring that future to today to make it more experiential. And this is another area of foresight which is called experiential futures, where design and art are really powerful to to, as I said before, bring these futures that may not seem tangible to future to, to today where you can experience it. And with that, also start thinking about whether whether it's a, it's a good idea, how am I going to react, how do people react, what do we need to change, what do we need to actually do about it? So, um, yeah, I mean, from a, I have a bias, I'm a designer, but that is one of my, my favorite areas of, of futures, for sure, to to kind of make it tangible and, and uh, incorporate this emotional piece for people to actually live it. Yeah, and we call this artifacts of the future. So how can you bring stuff, imagines and visions from the future into the present so it's actually more tangible and experiential? And there was a great uh, session of, of one um, uh, with actually the UN and some of most government leaders and they put a time machine in and asked the presidents and prime ministers over the world to go into this time machine and write a letter to a younger generation of what the decisions they made. And this was so powerful and impactful because they kind of felt first time the connection of the present and their impact uh, of the future and the present. So I think it is our uh, goal uh, as futurists as well to create those more tangible things in the present to talk about the future. Yeah, and uh, 
there is a very interesting bridge between art and design at the moment. When you see how design is going into critical design, speculative design, it's actually very close to what uh, visual artists are doing. And I think there is like a really interesting uh, uh, um, joint uh, position because design and art used to be quite separate. And I think there is a joint uh, territory now with this critical design approach and artifact, a fictional artifact of the future. It might join also what Envisioning says with a science fiction uh, uh, insight. Um, it's all of those, like all those visual experiential representation that help to give a sense of what it could be. It's really thought experiment. And this is like what we need to, you know, how can we engage in a thought experiment? Writing a book was also like, you know, what is what can be, how can we shape a thought experiment of the future by having an emotional dimension, a narrative, something that makes you feel that it's there. And you can, and, and, and by this experiential dimension, you can really have in your guts like the, uh, an, an, an appreciation of how much you like it or not. And maybe your, your, your body will react differently from your mind. Oh, so it's also having this dual. We dimension. have on the line Palak from Oslo. She's ta she her work is so two things. One is uh, we're the time the official time ends now. We'll do another few minutes, thirty minutes or so on overtime for those who want to keep who want to stay online. Um, I will I'll, I'll I'll stay here for for the next thirty minutes, but it's optional. And we have Palak from Oslo. Uh, uh, and you asked a question about designing complex systems and re related to well-being. Is that, do you want to bring that to the panel? Welcome. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about how a lot of what you're saying also connects with some of the projects that we are doing here in Norway and some of um, sort of um, the angle that design students have when they are working at the master's level. So it was interesting for me to sort of connect that too. But I think that uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about um, how designers actually learn how to work with foresight and futures thinking and uh, hear a little bit more from you in terms of, you know, what are some of, what in your opinion could be some of the biases that are encoded within the tools and methods that we use in terms of foresight um, methodologies and because some of them have legacies in in business or marketing or other disciplines. And you know that then gets transferred into the design work that may or may not have those intentions. So I wanted for you to speak a little bit on that. Um, sure, I'll, I can start briefly and, and I'll say uh, that at, at its core, Futures is in itself already um, um, a notion of something. There are in the world some, some communities that don't have futures in their language even. And what that means is that they don't think about the future so much. I think there, there's, um, I always get this one wrong, but I think it's somewhere in the Philippines or somewhere in, in Brazil, where is a community um, that doesn't utilize that word. So therefore they don't think about the future. Um, and I'm, I myself, I'm from Mexico. And, and I think our notion of thinking about the future and doing this in areas uh, tends to be sometimes a little problematic with real life, with the day to day, because we, we, we keep on um, um, overall uh, working on our, well, to day to day, right? Day to day to, to feed your family, to do whatever, whatever, whatever you do. And, and we uh, therefore don't have the mental capacity to look at the future. So I would say, um, and that, that's at, at its core, like what futures is. And then there are definitely different methodologies, methods and tools that are um, created with a bit bias uh, in itself because we are all humans, we have bias, right? And, and by creating a method where you're also in a way embedding this bias into your, the tool yourself. Uh, but I think I, I love all different methods and tools and I wouldn't say there's one that is magic for, for everything. You really need to look at the context you're, you, the context you're in, what are the challenges, challenges you're facing and, and then kind of look at uh, uh, what are these different methods, how you can use them differently. Yeah, and, uh, I think this it's... Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, sorry, Alex. Yeah. And there, uh, uh, like if, I, if I may also uh, 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 encourage you uh, to go in a learning by doing uh, approach, because you might learn some methods, but in fact, you could also start by having a micro future lab by yourself or one, uh, one of your colleagues 
uh, at the university and say, okay, let's have like a, this month, we are, we dre we are, we're looking for the future of one, one topic that you choose. And just like improvise and just trust your intuition to figure out how you would, you, you would do it. And once you've done that experiment, then you look at methods. You know, uh, and 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 in a way, I think it's really I think a very interesting learning experiment to learn without knowing how to do. Like you know, just kind of like okay, put your head on something, and and see how you would uh, how would you build would you build your reasoning, and then after that you can do it with a guidance and with a method and a professor. But by oh, doing wow. it by yourself beforehand, it will already give you a little bit of a critical distance on listening to your professor and the method you will be you know, trained. I and think, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting point. In fact, uh, for my master thesis project, I pretty much did that to be able to not go in with certain mindsets of what future should be and etc. But I also want to speak a little bit to uh, uh, your point, uh, Graciela, if, if I'm saying your name correctly, please. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, I think that um, what I'm also learning, uh, also because I'm at the moment working on a futures project. Uh, it's an EU project and we're doing it with three other universities. So there's a lot that I'm learning in terms of different perspectives um, and not just be limited to methods. Um, but I also wanna speak a little bit to what you were saying in terms of the capacity to think about futures and why some communities may or may not have it. And as I'm learning a little bit more about uh, decolonial methods, I'm learning also about how a lot of the tools and ways of thinking, mental models that we have, they seem to have come from a certain knowledge system that may or may not be, um, that may not reconcile with different knowledge systems that exist in different communities. So I wonder if these different communities that in our perception may or may not have the capacity to work with a certain way of thinking about futures, maybe they have their own knowledge systems and their own ways of relating with futures that, you know, is just in conflict with our understanding because, you know, we don't, we don't see the world as the way it is, but we see the world the way we are. So mm -hmm. how do we then as designers who are interested in shaping these futures also are cognizant of these knowledge systems, mental models and biases that are encoded within our tools and methodologies. And I think that connects really well with Raphael, what you said. Again, I don't know if I'm saying your no name correctly, please please uh, tell me if I'm not. But uh, I really liked what you said about not being limited by the tools and sort of exploring your own way of thinking. And yeah, a lot of it is what we're doing now. So it's really good to hear that from you as well. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I think just to add, <laughs> that uh, to know that um, we can get rid of our biases assumption completely. We can just get more aware of them, uh, that they exist and invite others, especially from uh, other countries and other stories and other backgrounds, um, to listen to them and understand why they see uh, it differently and mm. to not see either future studies for granted. So tomorrow we, we're trying our community. It's also to challenge the, the future of future studies because I think we were at a point where we're thinking, is the scenario it is, is all the methods that we have, or can we hack it? And we let our members co-create sessions and just come up with new methods because we believe everyone can create a futures method when having a certain intention of thinking and talking about the future. And this is way more inclusive, I think, than um, saying you have to have knowledge of certain methods to do so and to start yeah. this conversation around it and to challenge it and to see those influences of design thinking, of system thinking, and really seeing what can future studies learn to change Mm. and we invent ourselves and not not been stuck in what has been invented um, a couple of years ago yeah yeah i think really there is point. nothing oh, One oh sorry for rafaela no. where is rafaela based in france in paris in paris yes oh. uh, maybe I, I answer to uh, palak about this decolonial uh, i think it's a, it's one of the key issues in the art world, the, the, in the cultural, uh, uh, in the agenda of the cultural global globalization, this is exactly what's going on, and that's also I'm I'm again uh, referring to the art world as a 
the zone of prefiguration. It's extremely interesting how like the contemporary art world is shifting to this multipolar, multi, multi, multi um, pluriversalism. That's a term that uh, people use. A plur multiverse, pluri pluriversalism, as uh, opposed to universalism. But what I can uh, point also is how like using the future also can be a way to analyze your own value system, how the future has been used to build those, for instance, like in religion, in monotheist religions, all of them, the future has been a very important ingredient, you know, with you have like this heaven and hell, this future promise. All your life is geared toward that future promise. That future promise or punishment, you know, heaven and hell, those that duel, is it going to be a happy end? Or is it going to be a bad end? And this is everything is structured around that future promise. It's just, nobody is demonstrating it. No demonstration is being made, but everything is geared around that future perspective. And so it's also, you know, it can be what are the futures of different cultures, but it can be also how the future is an instrument in each of those cultural background and cultural systems. So, you know, and I think the heaven and hell is like really, even today we are still in like, is it going to be a happy future, a desirable future, or is it going to be a dystopian vision? And we have this yeah. dual like, oh, positive, negative, and we are constantly, and so I think this is part of the core fundament mm. of, the, of the human mindset. In, in all its diversity, we always have like, is it, do I try that future or am I scared of that future? Mm. Desire and fear, that's two core engines of the future. And as a foresight expert, that's also something that you use. And when I was saying that in the, on a trading floor, you know, you were using the future either to scare or to create an appetite <laughs> for your client. It's the same dual dynamic. And it's really an instru it's an extremely powerful instrument. And that's mm. why it's important to have a personal culture and I come back on the future literacy, it's like really cultivating that ability to be like, you know, to have a little bit of discerning of like what people tell me here. <laughs> I think uh, it's it's a really important point that duality, the thinking in terms of either or, and what you said earlier about pluriversal or pluriversality, I think that also hits at the core of this dualistic way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in terms of the values and beliefs that you said, um, the project that I'm working on now, um, one of our partners, which is uh, UAL, they are working with sort of these philosophical standpoints where they look at what are our orientations and attitudes as designers when we go into a design project, you know? Are we going in with an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset or, you know, how do we see and what are our worldviews that we are always not aware of when we go in as designers? So to be able to make that more explicit uh, and be more aware of that when we are working on such projects. So I think it's, yeah, these points are really resonating with me. And also, uh, yeah, and, and to give another tip, I think it's not necessarily so much of like knowing exactly, like taking a, a specific stance. It's, it can be also in the diversity of those options. Uh, if you are able to have a kind of like, okay, whether it's um, plan A, B, C, D, if, some, if, if I somehow know what I would be doing in each of those cases, then I don't need so much to be so sure about any of those options because in, a, in each of those options, I'm resilient. I would know about more or less what to do. And I think this is a mindset to adopt now. It's not so much because otherwise we keep on searching for an ideal solution. And I think now it's more about being agile and being like, mm. okay, I, I can imagine, I can make a diversity of thought experiment and envision different uh, uh, possibilities, scenarios. And if for some reason I'm future, I become future proof the moment I, I have a, a, a more or less of a, a, a behavior and solutions to address each of those uh, situations. And then I'm, you know, I'm cool. I don't need to know exactly. No, I think it's a really important point that flexibility and that comfort with uncertainty exactly. and also be able to work what my professor says amphibiously, you know, be both land and water and be able to shift easily and not be stuck in a way of knowing or doing. I think these are really important points. Yeah. 
Thank you for your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. But I think One another point concerning this image concept for Rafael and for everybody. At the, I was totally flashed by Berlin House der Kultur und der Welt, the House of Cultures of the World. I hope you know it. It's near to Chancellor Merkel. They did a Bilder Atlas exhibition. And I think this is outstanding because there are also young scholars from this Bilder Forsyth group at Warburg Institute in London. And if you look at all these lectures, I think it becomes clear that the recent research enable us to understand images, figures in a new way and to what we are talking here now about to improve our imaginations. Huh? I, I think this has not at all come across medicine. I know for medicine, they don't do build up this research and I think technologies neither. Huh? In, in Munich here, there is a nice center for art history, but they don't connect these old images to high-tech science, and I think it's possible. So Germany is sleeping a little bit, and I hope Europe gives a push to all these nice resources coming up now. And um, the ministries have supported this, this cultural ministry, Grütters, but they don't communicate with medicine. I, I talked with the ministry level, so politics should be open, open up for this. Yeah, and, and you, you speak about images of the future, but we could be also speak of like, what are the images associated to technologies today, for instance, to make a bridge with also uh, envisioning a uh, uh, scan. Uh, we, you know, there, there is a full aesthetic of technology and also like uh, the future space, you show that wall of images also. And it's typically the images we, when, we, when you do a, a Google search with a, just artificial intelligence and you look at the images that come out, they all have that, came, that same kind of aesthetic of a, like a little bit of mysticism behind that blue, that deep blue uh, uh, um, background, a little bit of a cosmic dimension. And there is, you know, th those aesthetic are not uh, neutral. They, 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 they serve, they, they speak of uh, the values we associate to what we look at. And it's true that it's uh, uh, whether in the past and like to, to come back on images of science and medicines in the uh, later in the 15th century, which was also the moment uh, Western science were created, you know, the demonstration, demonstration, monstration. If science was created because we started to have this very, very precise representation of the body. And first scientists were, were artists. Leonardo da Vinci was having those extremely precise representation of the body. And it's because we were able to create very precise representation that we were able to produce knowledge. So this junction between representation and knowledge and science is extremely intimate. Still nowadays, when you see images of science and technology, they, they, they do speak not just of their scientific dimension, but also of their cultural and even spiritual dimension, our Absolutely. belief in the back. How did you know about this? How did you come across this? It's quite rare knowledge, as far as I know. Well, I mean, uh, as I said, uh, I've used a uh, uh, history of art as is one of my core uh, intellectual background, history of uh, economy and history of uh, science. And uh, so it's like a lot of, you know, it's being like a little bit of a, <laughs> of a, uh, of a, uh, of a nerd of uh, looking and reading a lot of things. And it's my project also that uh, allows me to... My uh, so let's topic. start wrapping up here. We have a packed agenda for the rest of the Agora. Uh, I want to be. I want to thank everyone so much for showing up. the The conversation could not have been more engaging and more challenging and more uh, interesting, at least from my perspective. I hope we managed to address most of the questions in the Q and A. Uh, it was a very lively discussion going on in the back channel. And, we, and uh, we're doing a lot more of these. So uh, keep signing up for the other sessions. We're gonna see a lot more of you, hopefully. I know um, Rafael is doing a bunch of sessions. Please share the link in the chat so people can sign up in the next few minutes. And also Tanya and Graciela, I know are also doing a bunch of other sessions. Please share them as well so people know where to sign up. And as for Tiara and myself, we have three full days ahead of us with, with a lot more conversations in Portuguese and English. Um, we want to keep exploring these subjects, and um, the conversation doesn't stop here. It's only, I'm putting only my positive. email in the in the chat, uh, so oh, that people please, are... please, it's amazing. You are amazing people from the future. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, just to comment on the question, because I see a lot of people also have been sharing links 
on different projects. And um, I, will, I will certainly take the time to look at them. We haven't been able to comment on each of them, but I will, I will personally take the time to look at each of the links you shared and feel free to add some more uh, if you want. I'm always curious to hear about amazing project going on uh, around the globe. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe also to comment on our session, I think it's very uh, fertile discussion. And, and I think we have like three different culture of the future. It's quite a, I, I, I would love to continue that conversation with you guys. No? I think it's a- it's Yeah, really Rafael, I think it, it was great. And we didn't really, uh, to be honest, didn't know how this was going to go. So this was an experiment in itself with, for oh, the yeah. summit to kind of the three of us come together uh, tell tell our stories and then and then have a discussion around our approaches and our views. So thank you all for for coming, for staying here, and for being engaged and asking questions uh, and all that. I think uh, it, it was it was a great session, really. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, also thank you, uh, Envisioning, for uh, taking a lot part of the organization and uh, hosting uh, here. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to us uh, via LinkedIn or our community. And we're looking forward to talk more about the future because I think this is one of the strongest tools. It's our brain, our conversation and our imagination. Uh, and, and you can find on my LinkedIn page the, the links to the two sessions I'm having tomorrow. One yeah. on weak signals, more with companies. Uh, it's at nice. 11 uh, uh, um, tomorrow morning. And uh, another one with the Foresight Journal tomorrow afternoon, where I will speak of the bridge between art and the future. So uh, the links are on my LinkedIn page uh, and on the website of leader, um, uh, liid.fr. And so I'm shutting down here. We have to set up the next room. Uh, it, this was lovely. Uh, we're and we're sending out we're sending you a collection of the slides to everyone who was part of this because that was the right. most requested feature. <laughs> yeah. See you guys. Thank you. Wrapping it this Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, you all. Bye. bye. bye everyone.